What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest, episode 202, on Friday, December 13th, at block height 607,974. What is cracking, guys? Oh, nothing. Just getting the day going early, trying to get back into the swing of things. Episode 202, halfway through December. Can hardly believe it's almost 2020. But, yeah, do... Uh, Going through the news. How are you doing today, Janine? I'm still in complete darkness. <laughs> it is like I am counting the days until the winter solstice to where the days start getting longer again because it is just, uh, I don't know, all the darkness getting early and staying in the dark is it's really bumming me out these days. But you're making it through there, huh? You doing okay in that darkness? Yeah, I've got some furry critters to look after if my brain wasn't so full of holes there would be a tolkien quote in there for this moment <laughs> yeah but uh yeah it's good to have some but yeah it's been a lot going on in the news i mean uh i've been trying to keep up but it seems like this uh this past week a lot of stuff has been going on yeah, uh, I'm actually kind of shocked too. Uh, you know, at least me on Twitter, I'm not seeing a lot of discussion of a lot of this stuff. Just uh, complaining about certain personal drama that seems to be the most important thing in everybody's mind. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, talk about yeah, the Twitter drama. It's out there. I saw like uh, Peter McCormick said he's out for a little bit, which. You know, go for it, man. Take a break. Like, you know, I like I recently took that break and stepped out of our bubble for like a for like a about a month, month and a half there. Like where I really stepped out and I felt like uh, I don't know. I feel great coming back. I feel like I understand how to regulate my stress a little bit better now with all this uh, stuff I'm doing with working out and everything. I want to talk to Samson. Fly me to the moon like that bitch Alice Cranston. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, but yeah. So I guess uh, I, don't know. I think for once we're actually going to have something really kind of positive to talk about. So I guess you, you want to start with uh, some positive news? Just jump into it? Yeah, absolutely, man. Let's just steer fear of all the drama and jump right into the best news that, yeah, I saw. This was some awesome stuff. Yeah, take us into it. So Square Crypto, uh, the organization set up that is independent from Square and Cash App, um, announced that they have sa- or supplied a grant to synonymous vel- – wow, okay, words, mouth, reboot, okay – have provided a grant to the pseudonymous developer ZMN SCPXJ. And those who follow um, kind of the – you know, he's been, he's been around for years, but those those who follow the lightning developments uh, and mailing lists and kind of, you know, the weird edges where people talk about more advanced kind of smart contract systems on things like Bitcoin, um, ZMN, uh, I'll call them for short uh, from now on, uh, is, you know, really just been pumping out awesome ideas for years. And he's just been contributing in his spare time to little things. He's been uh, contributing to Sea Lightning uh, for two years now. And so completely uh, anonymously, they have provided a grant um, that was at least big enough for him to leave his full-time job, uh, which he's been working this entire time he's been contributing to Bitcoin, and move full-time into Lightning and Bitcoin development. 
and in the, the the tweet thread where they announced this um they they actually um spell out that they they don't even know where he lives aside from the time zone so from that i i have to assume that this this grant was delivered in bitcoin and without even privately doxing him um you know just between square crypto and him to handle the, this grant so like you know square is not not only just provided a grant to a, a very prolific figure i think in this space if, if you really pay attention to the development side of things but they've, they've done so respecting his privacy and actually allowing him to continue to just be a pseudonym in, in receiving this grant so you know like really the, the the way i wrote it down in the in the news desk i mean this in my mind shows me that that jack and square crypto trying to get involved in in this space they're real like this, this is not phony baloney bullshit with some corporate suit coming in and blowing smoke up people's ass like they are here for real and you know i think this is a pretty fucking awesome moment to see if, if you know like where are they going to go what are they going to do continue walking down this road actually respecting what this space is about to this degree come on Janine. i'm gonna let the conversation head your way janine what do you think about this this is credible uh well the only thing well yeah i do i do find it really awesome that he's able to maintain his privacy and still work for a big company and not have to sacrifice that just to make a living um like so many other people so that's really cool um i the one funny thing is uh i did have to i corrected someone at a meetup yesterday um that they said that he was being uh sponsored by shift crypto and i had to quickly fix that uh mistake <laughs> um i was like no they don't have the money for that um sorry you, you got that <laughs> wrong <laughs> yeah i think i saw them uh you know pushing out some advertisements yeah this is square crypto they are just killing it man these guys uh you know they're de- open source and like you know what they've done as far as already getting some uh, core developers deep down that are getting you know funded to where they can work full time on the bitcoin protocol and not have to worry about you know how are you going to get the groceries and to see uh somebody that has been so prolific on the uh lightning and bitcoin mailing list uh you know z man i think everybody there calls him you know it's good to see uh him get some credit and like you know just a pseudonym like that i think it's uh it goes you know it shows a little bit about what bitcoin is and everything where you know, somebody might read this and they go, wait a minute, who's getting funded? Like this person that nobody knows? Like, what is this? And then like, they'll start falling down the rabbit hole of what is Bitcoin development and how exactly that works. And, uh, you know, yeah, you can be uh, somebody that's very prolific and nobody actually knows who you are. Mm-hmm. And that's I mean, the way most of it is. You know, and, and aside from just like, you know, how much of a demonstration, I think, of, of Jack and, and Square Crypto specifically and what they're planning. Like, this is the first step of where things need to go. You know, like this whole topic of like, how do we fund development and organizations for that is something that's come up a lot uh, on the show that, that we've talked about. And, you know, especially the, the whole last round of nonsense with the B Foundation that a number of people tried to start. And it's like this, what Square is doing is what people need to do. Like not like stop trying to make the the all encompassing organization for this kind of shit. Like if you have a company, spin off something like Square Crypto. You dedicate your money. Let all of the individual players do this and decide where they allocate things instead of create this this centralization of deciding who who gets money for developing what in the space. Like if you, if you want to contribute openly, spin off a a company like Square Crypto. Don't try and look for the the, the one thing you can just funnel money into. Like this is how you create incentives like this that work properly is each individual company doing this kind of open funding of development in in the place that benefits them 
And if you have all the big companies doing this, then it should roughly cover all the bases. And you don't have that one place that is kind of like, well, if they don't fund you, good luck. And you know what I mean? It's like, this is fucking awesome. Like this is that first step towards trying to get people to emulate this model. Heck yeah, man. It's, uh, you know, yeah, Square Crypto is pretty heavily linked in there with uh, a lot of different moving pieces there. And I mean, uh, we can go right into this next story as far as, uh, you know, what this is going to help. I mean, you know, I think this relates with this, uh, what Twitter's trying to move towards more just like uh, being a open source platform, like uh, going from platform to protocol, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and th th this is like, you know, this is just as crazy as, as the shit with Square Crypto. Like, you know, the same day, Jack announces that Twitter is funding a small team um, kind of independently, the same way Square Crypto is isolated from things, um, called Blue Sky. And the entire point of this team is to look for a way to kind of, yeah, turn Twitter into an open protocol, like a social media protocol for the internet the way smtp is just a general email protocol for the whole internet and shift twitter into just being one possible client of that and you know it's i've, I've seen a lot of different reactions about this you know like a lot of people like well it's twitter's like censorship you're a hypocrite or people just blindly going awesome but you know, I think the reality of this is a little more nuanced. And I think like the, the first core thing you should look at is regardless of whether this actually happens or goes anywhere or whatever, it shows this is where Jack's head is at. Like regardless if the board gets on, on board with it or like the, the team actually pulls something workable, it's this is where his head is at. Like he wants to go in this direction. And then, you know, the people, you know, just looking at the, the hypocrisy given how Twitter acts right now and just calling bullshit on this. Um, well, one, you know, Jack is not unilaterally in control of everything at Twitter. Um, that's not how this works. And then secondly, is the it's, it's not going to happen attitude. Really think about Twitter and all of these kinds of tech companies. They're pretty much just advertising companies. And it's a giant open secret that advertising is completely manipulated. Um, there are civil accounts making up probably half or so of the, the total accounts on the internet. Um, that whole market's a joke. It's, it's an illusion. But that's all of these companies' core revenue. And so, you know, does it really seem that crazy in that kind of environment that somebody like Jack could actually convince the shareholders and, and the, the board of the company to move along in that kind of direction. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is an open secret and especially the, these tech companies know this. So that's just a ticking time bomb of revenue disappearing. So but you know, if you really sit down and think about it, like it, it's not as crazy as, as a lot of the detractors are, are, trying to make it seem that something like this could actually happen in the long term. Yeah, man. I mean, like we talked about last episode, the way uh, Jack, you know, was moving over to uh, Africa for like six months to, or something like around six months next year to try and like put together some sort of full stack protocol for uh, people. Like, I mean, he said on, you know, I mean, just going into Jack's character, I mean, he's, been on Joe Rogan where he's talked about like the way that he views Twitter as being like something where you know you can bring free speech to the world and uh, you know that's something that is very evident he's trying to do I mean he, it looks like he's living that lifestyle by moving to Africa for a period of time to try and build this thing and yeah when you look at all the moving pieces to Square Crypto and what all they're invested in and uh, you know you see the cash app Twitter Square and uh, these things and you combine them in like a stack and just try and make it to where it's an open protocol where anybody can spin up an instance similar to Mastodon or uh, what are those other uh, platforms uh, similar to that. I know there's a couple 
and uh, you know, just to where there's like this competition of trying to create a social networking stack that can't be censored. You know, I mean, Cash App is got it's heavily invested in Bitcoin, and they're looking into like it seems like they're looking into a lot of different projects within Bitcoin with Square Crypto, and I mean. I just hope, like, you know, the things that we've seen in the past with Twitter as far as censorship and uh, that sort of stuff is a thing of the past. And, like, this sort of new development on the way route forward and this sort of step forward for Twitter and Jack and Square, uh, all this stuff uh, is in a direction that is uh, meant to be asymmetric in its ability to be used to where, like, uh, nobody can really be, you know, pushed out of it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, if you really look at, like this this team and what they they want to do i mean one it's not it's not completely crazy or impossible that this actually happens in in five years ten years like that that's not really that crazy uh, if you really sit and think about it and then you know as far as like jack personally i mean you know like people put this or get this impression from him that he's just like the, just another silicon valley like out of touch idiot wandering around in virtue signaling and it's it's not entirely wrong like that that's not like there is no part of his character like that but that said like i looking at him and, and what he's been doing lately see more of a patience and actual attempt to understand what's going on before he does something rather than just i glance at it and then i virtue signal yeah i mean he definitely seems more invested i mean like we're saying with this trip and trying to actually move down there and fix things and uh you know i mean he's you know went back to rogan after they like uh after he was called out for uh kind of placating jack on his first episode and then you know, Jack brings in some Twitter execs to address Rogan's problem. I mean, yeah, it seems like he's really trying to walk the walk, and he doesn't just have, like, a quick reactionary. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I met the guy once at, uh, like, you know, some Twitter event here in Boulder, and he was very chill and calm and, like, in the moment, even though there was, like, a parade of people around him trying to talk to him, like, you know, talking to that guy in, like, a place that's... It wasn't even really public. It was kind of private public thing, event, and um, for sure, everybody was trying to talk to him, but he was real slow. He, must, he might have been chilling some of the microdosing or something at that point. I think some people were saying he might be microdosing because he was pretty chill. Uh, maybe, right. maybe. <laughs> Janine, you got anything else to say about uh, Jack Square Crypto, uh, Z-Man, any of this stuff? Uh, nope, just... It's definitely not shift crypto. <laughs> well, will Twitter make it impossible for Twitter to be evil, or will they fail? Um, I no, I don't, I don't. I mean, what is it? What does it mean for Twitter to be evil that they haven't already done, like silencing people that shouldn't be silenced? I mean, if if they turn their whole platform into an open protocol, then they can't do that anymore. Well, they could. They would just have, like, they would become the uh, censorship client <laughs> in that network. Yeah, but it's not going to erase it completely or stop people from seeing things if they want to. She brings up a really good point. I mean, that's the that's my fear in it is that you know, like, create this full stack and then like it somehow gets in the hands of somebody that I mean, you know, or like you know, yeah, like they've demonstrated in the past, like you know, to where it becomes a tool of tyranny, and I definitely don't want to see that. Yeah, but I mean, if a user has total control over their client, they used to interact with the protocol. Excuse me, they can't do that. I know. It's the way it sounds in theory, but I totally understand her point. All right. Well, I guess we will see. But uh, I guess move along. Yeah, let's start. Uh, let's go into some pretty uh, pretty well-known, like, uh, bad intention people. Let's, uh, let's talk. Let's kick into this next story. Yeah, so uh, Bitfury is up to some shady shit again. 
Uh, so a little while back, um, I went over a protocol being developed um, in partnership uh, between CypherTrace and Shift Network to create a second layer uh, protocol for Bitcoin to pass personal information between institutions um, as far as where the money is coming from, whose it is, where it's going, who that person is, yada, yada. That was just a completely retarded, insecure, idiotic architecture to try and comply with the FATF's travel rule going into effect uh, with crypto. Uh, well, Bitfury has made a strategic acquisition, the details of which are not public, um, of Shift Network, one of the companies involved in this protocol. And they are pretty much getting directly involved and having their um, Exonum um, Enterprise Blockchain Subsidiary and Crystal, their blockchain analytics subsidiary, uh, partner with Shift and CypherTrace uh, to develop this protocol. And so this is at the point now where I think uh, it's time to start ringing alarm bells and really look at this because there, there is now a mining company getting involved with the, this second layer protocol to tie identifying information to Bitcoin transactions. And I'm, I'm going to go now back down history lane for those who aren't familiar. Um, there, there was a program, I think, in 2015 or 16 that came out of MIT Labs um, that Peter Todd wrote a lot about. Um, I'll include his summation of this in the show notes. Um, but the, this program, Chain Anchor, was pretty much a protocol to create a second layer um, of Bitcoin that included personally identifiable information tied to a Bitcoin transaction on the network. And the idea behind Chain Anchor was to start bribing miners, like subsidized miners, to prefer to include uh, transactions with associated ID information. And eventually, over time, um, shift by subsidizing the miners to um, trying to incentivize them to only mine transactions with this identifying information. So over time, start with this incentive to prefer those and then slowly shift it into censoring everything except Bitcoin transactions that come with this ID information connected to it. So I, I have been bringing this, this old project up for years now, constantly. Um, because it seems like every time I bring it up, nobody remembers it or what it was, or that it's a potential attack vector for this kind of network. And I think right now with Bitfury and Cypher Trace and Shift Networks, um, getting this deeply involved together as a company building such a protocol and a mining firm involved in the network, um, this is time to start actually looking at this as a serious potential risk. Because this is something that was laid out literally years ago, and it just keeps fading back to the corners of the collective memory. Everybody keeps forgetting it. And that needs to change now. Because the seeds of what you need to actually make that kind of system a reality are starting to be laid now. Yeah, I mean... Uh... This is something that I mean, I kind of slipped my attention, and I'm glad you're, uh, you know, ringing the alarm bell again because, yeah, Bitfury has uh, definitely been out there working with governments trying to track these transactions, and you know, we've talked about how the FATF travel rule kind of like uh, it kind of wrecks the whole value proposition of Bitcoin and you know these cryptocurrency networks, and uh, yeah, I posted this link in the chat right now and. Bitcoin teen is asking me about it and it's this is this did catch my attention you know and it's just like something where I'm saying it's this is a trend where it's like these exchanges are trying to follow this travel rule I guess to you know keep operating and uh, yeah Chainalysis posted a tweet that said that they were working with Bitfinex on some know your transaction uh, product that they provide and uh, I don't know how much is in there in the world. Bitfinex able to still provide privacy and you know we're talking about one of the major exchanges that still operates on like a uh, on a level for 
part a lot of uh, pseudo anonymous accounts, and it's just uh, it's just curious as far as like seeing that and hearing about this. And we know we've known now for a long time that the uh, that this travel rule was being coming down, and it looked like these exchanges were starting to fall in line. And something that I guess uh, we're going to have to deal with in this next era, where it's like these exchanges and most on ramps that you're using with Bitcoin are all the, these. Uh, you know, walled gardens where all of these tracks, transactions are being tracked and traced and, you know, wrecking this uh, value proposition that this uh, whole industry is trying to provide. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is what I mean. Like, this, this is slow moving. Like, when you look at threats to something like Bitcoin, like, they're not going to just go pop. They're not just going to appear overnight. You're not just going to instantly recognize that and go, oh, it's an attack on Bitcoin. It's going to creep in slowly. And, like, it's it's going to happen right out in the open. You know, like, like I said, Chainacre, that, that paper, that, that, that whole project design is years old. And now, years later, we're slowly starting to see the players needed to build that work together work on the individual pieces of it like y you can't look at this space and try to identify threats and just do so with the goldfish news cycle memory that forgets what happens last week when the new thing this week happens Oh, man, yeah, we need to hurry up and get towards these uh, actual decentralized exchanges. I mean, you know, I know BISC is doing a great job and everything, but I've seen, like, a, you know, a few papers and uh, stories about these uh, next-level, you know, decentralized exchanges to where nobody's really in control over them. And, you know, because, uh, yeah, that's got to get implemented if we want to keep this thing moving forward in a way that, you know, we still provide a uh, use case for a large portion of what this is being used for. I mean, Janine, I know you have to have something to say. Come on. I don't have something to say. I think you are lying and saying that to spite me. You mean that Bit Fury is a sack of shit? See, you did have something to say. You did lie. I mean, well, yeah. So if anyone is not aware, big expose about... Bitfury and their stupid lightning peach thing that we did. Uh, was that this year? No, uh, it was last yeah. year. Yeah, no, it was this year. It was the beginning of this year. Wow. It isn't. Why? Oh, God. I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time now. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so th this is definitely something we need to pay attention to and keep coming back to and not just let slip out of everybody's attention in a week. Yeah, I know. I was just trying to remember too. I was like, did the FATF travel rule get implemented this year or last year? It's, yeah, it's this year because last year they just started the KYC stuff. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how it's like, yeah, yeah. I, all right. Let's not reminisce too much. Let's get into Something else that's going on. Some uh, I've been hearing a lot about this because a few mm -hmm. of these people are from my neck of the woods. So uh, what's going on with this next story? Uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of them are. Um, so uh, three men so far, uh, two remain at large, uh, have been arrested for operating BitClub, um, which a lot of you may know as a mining pool um, or – a giant uh, Ponzi scheme where um, <laughs> the Justice Department is claiming they, they uh, received the equivalent of over $722 million worth of Bitcoin in this Ponzi scheme. Uh, Matthew Brent uh, Gaucher, I think, um, Jobadiah Sinclair Weeks, and Joseph Frank Abel are the three that have been arrested. And the other two defendants um, are at large with their identities still under seal until their arrest. But pretty much, um, for those who aren't aware of BitClub, um, they've been around since 
around 2014. And most of the, the their model, it's pretty much the same kind of model as a cloud mining company. Um, you just buy a membership and then pay them and they supposedly take that money and buy hardware to mine on your behalf, um, charging, you know, whatever fees for maintenance and such. Um, and the people have been pointing at this, this mining pool for literally almost its entire existence and pointing out how shady it is. Um, how they have never been able to actually provide any kind of systematic or comprehensive proof of the claimed hash rate they claim to operate or the revenue from that. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, they, they pretty much were lying, not buying hardware with people's money and pretty much running a multi-level um, marketing scheme where they just took in money from people uh, paid out older people and just just pulled money out whenever they wanted to to spend on stupid shit um and yeah uh they're by the looks of this um completely fucked um th there are cited um just in in the announcement on their arrest um communications between them personally saying things like just bump up the the mining reward by 60 percent um and then the person who did so responded, that's not sustainable, that, that's Ponzi territory, but okay. And then another instance when they wanted, or one of the, the members wanted to adjust them down now so that he can retire rich as fuck really soon. And literally just pulling money out. Um, one of the members um, outright um, said he, he was not comfortable with the fact that they were just taking and spending uh, customers money um and not using it to buy mining hardware um and, and it seems based on this that the justice department pretty much has all of their personal communications outright discussing um criminal conspiracy so i mean to me that like they're fucked by the looks of this <laughs> like all of those communications if they cannot be voided or deemed inadmissible somehow they're fucked like they're completely fucked. Yeah, like I said, you know, this kind of got thrown around my way because uh, some of these people were like really from my neck of the woods over here, as far as like being in Colorado. Uh, and um, yeah, they uh, I searched I searched through my meetup member list just to see like did I meet these guys? And I I don't know I don't think I ever met them. Um, but yeah, I mean you know I'm always kind of weary of like. Uh, these sort of things going on uh, because yeah, I do have lots of people that do come through the meetup and there are, you know, we live in an area that is, uh, you know, got a lot of tech going on, a lot of startups, a lot of people that are trying to pitch different ideas and this stuff sort of does come through where every now and again, I got to be like, okay, let me sort of suss out this, I, this thing that I'm hearing about and like uh, make sure it's not something. Cause you know, I'm as a meetup organizer, I kind of got to be on top of that to make sure that my, Members are getting accosted by somebody like these uh, BitCub guys. And, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah, not too surprised to see that, um, you know, this stuff is finally getting busted up as far as people that have been taking advantage of a lot of uneducated people for a long time. And, I mean, it's, you know, as much as, much as like, I, you know, a lot of the – and cap and and libertarian aspect of like you know oh well, these people you know whatever they i don't know this is a lot of fraud going on these people should be taken care of and like it's good to see some of these people get taken down and i mean uh you know i don't know i maybe i should investigate a little bit more into like everything they did but as far as i understand it was like they were never actually providing any real mining rewards or anything like that it was just you know a straight out Ponzi scheme, which if that's the case, I mean, you know, these people deserve to be somewhere for the fraud they committed. And yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And a nice little historical note, um, during the whole UASF and preceding things, um, they, they actually started mining BU for a while after making arrangements with Roger Bear and then had a, a big falling out with him and he called them a, a scam on Twitter. It was a whole big public thing. And then he ended up deleting that tweet and posting a video very reminiscent of Mt. Gox um, saying, 
he apologized and BitClub was definitely not a scam. <laughs> oh shit. There it is, you know. All these characters tied up with Roger. Yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say uh batting two for uh two and oh at this point that anything Roger says is not a scam is a scam. <laughs> All right, well, moving away from these scammers and some other people that Roger is associated with, like, uh, I've been seeing something about this. You know, it looks like the big bad Bitmain is coming mm-hmm. back. Like, what's going on here, man? Tell me about it. So I'm going to toot my own horn here. Uh, I am a genius, and I totally called this. So, <laughs> okay, um, you get it. Yeah. Uh, I think two episodes ago. Uh, I covered a Bitcoin magazine article where they went through like just the, the shifting of mining to, to North America and the different uh, landscapes um, regionally. And I kind of pointed out that the little note in there, like just a quick blurb about how Bitmain was expanding to start offering services um, to help miners plan and set up logistics for mining farms or migrate um, their their current farms and operations. And so pretty much uh, Jihan Wu um, in Chengdu, China, um, made a public appearance um, on stage and made a speech pretty much talking about how Bitmain is completely um, changing how they do business exactly along um, those lines. Um, to completely shift how the, the finances are handled between them and their customers and shift much more of the risk to them to incentivize uh, people from still working with them. So um, first off, they're introducing a different um, pricing um, setup. Um, essentially, the, the more miners you order, um, the less you actually have to pay up front until they ship. So if you're ordering between 100 um, to 1,000 miners, um, you only have to pay 50% up front. Um, anybody ordering more than 5,000 um, can pay as little as 20% up front. So they're, they're pretty much shifting all of the, the, the capital risk um, of a, a miner or a, a lot of the capital risk, not all, um, when he buys equipment and has to wait for that to arrive and get set up and start returning money um, by kind of waiting until they're actually shipping to get whatever percentage depending on your order size from the customer. So they, they are taking on a lot of the risk from the customer now to try to incentivize um, you know people to, to keep buying their equipment. The, the second is they're going around now um, and trying to set up co-mining agreements with farm operators that have excess space they can't fill. Uh, and pretty much the, the arrangement is they will cover the electricity costs of operating the equipment while the miner or the, the farm operator is responsible for maintenance and Bitmain will retain 75% of mining profits from their equipment and give 25 to the farm operator with a clause that if the total mining revenue is less than the electricity cost, Bitmain keeps everything and the farm operator gets nothing. So they're, they're even here, you know, they're, they're shifting risk, but they're trying to cover their ass over the, the, the person they're making this arrangement with. And they've actually been ramping up, um, their use of, uh, or their their self mining operations through these types of arrangements, and even renting equipment um, to people with excess space as well, and the like the, this whole shift is is really insane. And like the the, the last thing is that they are literally um, creating a put option. That, that allows you to reserve the right to sell a certain amount of Bitcoin that, that's arrived at proportional to how much equipment you order um, at a fixed rate. So they're literally even setting up a hedging operation so that just by buying equipment from them, you can purchase from Bitmain themselves a hedge against the price of Bitcoin going down to some certain degree. And Bitmain will buy your Bitcoin at that price, at the exercise date, regardless of whether it's below it or not. 
So they're, they're taking on more risk here with the attempt to, again, keep the, the operations of their customers' farms more sustainable and them take on the risk from that. Like they are just doing everything they can to take on more risk to take it away from their customers to retain their customers. Like they're, they're literally doing exactly what I predicted they would do and shifting the entire business towards helping miners financially hedge and operate their, their entire operations, not just selling them equipment because that's where this space is going. So like the, the, this speech is, is literally panning out everything I said would happen. Man, Bitmain is just a big question mark. I mean, like, you know, I've been, it, it's just like ever since they took the big Bcash investment and they've been playing the shitcoin route and, you know, they lost a lot of money in that. They had some bad tape outs to where, like, uh, you know, they lost some money on that and then they were supposedly putting Wu behind them, but now Jihan Wu's coming back. My guess is that's got a little bit to do with this, like, he's a character I don't think they'll ever be able to shake. He's one of these characters within the, you know, the world of Bitcoin as far as like being one of those first movers. Maybe they just want to use him as the limelight. And I don't know. It's just like, are, are they really producing like the most efficient miners nowadays or no. like, or yeah. And that's the, that's the thing too, is like, you know, they're not really doing that. And they're trying to put a lot of these mining farm operators into some of these contracts to where they'll be trying to get these block rewards. And like, you know, if the energy ends up, expense begins to where like uh you know they could go belly up it's like the op the farm operators got to take that expense and bitmain's going to make sure that they still get there well, somehow well, but, yeah, but, but like the, the thing is though the, with that though, up. is, is they you, only they only keep the maintenance costs so as long as shit doesn't break or have to get fixed like only bitmain is paying money pretty much if it's below the the electricity cost Okay, well, however that works out, still, the Bcash investment and the shitcoinery shows like this, you know, it sways the incentive and value structure, especially, I mean, like, Bitmain is a Chinese company, right? And, like, you know, China's doing this thing. I mean, am I wrong on that? Like, is, is Bitmain a Chinese company? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that whole possible connection worries me because it's like what he's doing right now, what this whole pivot is doing is sinking costs into Bitmain from the customer's point of view. Like they're not just a place you go and get hardware and plug it in then. They are now an integral part of your mining operation. Like going to them guarantees you that you have less capital at risk when you buy equipment, that you can hedge your operation with these put options Bitmain is going to sell, like it, it becomes much more than just the place you get equipment. Like there's much more reason to stick with them once you really start. So the, 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 their whole shift here is to try to, to get those miners stuck and dependent on all of these other things that they, they're offering to help take risk away from customer or the customers and take it on themselves. Man, it's just like, you know, like I was saying at the beginning, this, it's a big question mark because, you know, I'm seeing some things here on the ground I'm, I'm not really at liberty to talk about. But, I mean, uh, you know, these guys are getting all mixed up with, uh, you know, people here locally. And, I, and not you know, it's just there's – I could see, like, these connections being formed where it's like this thing could be – like, they could run some sort of sustainable model that's not really anything to do with Bitcoin mining anymore. It's got a lot more to do with just – yeah, contracts and, you know, alliances and, you know, trying to keep this project alive or I don't know. They're just a big question mark. I'd like to know a little bit more about what's going on with them and just some of this mining equipment. It just seems like they're just trying to put together like this rigmarole of different products and different, you know, at the same time still making miners and selling those and just trying to play on this name of Jihan Wu and, move this, you know, train forward as long as they can until it's off the rails. I mean, like, I don't think the uh, the whole IPO situation, like, uh, I don't think that went anywhere. And so, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, Bitmain's a big question mark, and it's one that kind of I want to steer clear of. That's where I just, uh, yeah, 
I don't know. I need to hear more about what's going on with those guys. I mean, it, it's vertical integration. They're 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 trying to be the place you go for everything. Get your equipment, hedge your equipment, like optimize your capital risk, like find a place to hook your equipment up. Like they're they're it, it, this is like where I've been saying mining is going for years. They're going to vertically integrate everything. And if they can actually pivot and pull that off, then like they're they're not going anywhere. Ah oh, man, yeah, this is where it just gets me because you know, yeah, it, it's like we need to start, you know, making sure that these mining contracts, big mining farms that are getting built, you know, somewhere within the United States is not so tied up with other nation states and like what all that is dependent upon. And because, I mean, I know there's not like, you know, one nation. There's not, you know, Bitcoin's decentralized there's a lot of different nation states that are operating within bitcoin but it does seem like you know china's kind of like trying to ramp up on all that and even getting involved over here i mean i don't know you know this whole 2020 election stuff's coming up something i don't know it's crazy man i don't know how much we should get into that this is like this is a big discussion mm -hmm. it's gonna get really really weird and really intertwined with geopolitics very soon. Yeah, I mean, like, let's just go into the next one, because I know I got a lot to say on that, and, mm -hmm. like, it'll probably keep us in this. So, uh, all right, guys, we uh, keep reporting on Wyoming, and Caitlin Long keeps telling us on Twitter how far ahead they are with regulatory clarity in the state. But now we have proof of the Kraken opened up a position for an operations director to oversee a Wyoming Special Purpose Depository Institution, or SPDI. Essentially, Kraken would be opening a bank in Wyoming for their customers' fiat deposits. This would allow them to work around New York's heavy-handed bit license, which New York is currently trying to rework. It's still unclear, though, if uh, Kraken is applying for an SPDI or will they operate in an SPDI created by Wyoming. What we do know are some qualifications about the job, and uh, the director would be responsible for building out an operations team, developing systems and operational processes to be an SPDI, and integrating that entity into the exchange's platform. They would also have to ensure the functionality of different capabilities that come with being an SPDI, including access to Fedwire, Fedmaster accounts, and the automated clearinghouse and correspondent banking which all of this sounds promising, insiders in Wyoming have already acknowledged this could take a court case to cement the SPDI as a viable route around the New York bit license. If it does go to court, we might finally start to see some of the state competition in crypto really ramp up next year. I know Wyoming is moving headstrong towards their goal of attracting this type of business, and I could tell you Colorado is working at the same time to develop SPDI legislation to help censored markets. I'm going to take a uh, much deeper look into all the ins and outs of this since I am on this working group to evaluate new models that already exist out there. And Wyoming certainly is ahead of the game in this department. I'll keep you guys up to date on any of the developments that come out of this Colorado SPDI. But back to Wyoming and Kraken. They are looking for someone who's, who's had senior positions in banking and finance and understands all the intricate details with that sector. I honestly think Kraken should just try and scoop up Caitlin Long like they scooped up Pierre Richard. But if you think you have what it takes, just follow the link in the show notes and to the job listing and apply. You know, And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm on this working group in Colorado to build an SPDI, a special purpose depository, but I mean, like we haven't called it an institution yet. And that's just where like, uh, you know, this stuff is so early on as far as like Wyoming has even stated, like they, they might need a court case to actually cement this SPDI. And whenever we talk about the special purpose depository in Colorado, it's always in the context of censored markets and trying to provide a route around uh, federal censorship for censored markets because Colorado's, you know, well known now for its cannabis industry and like that has provided a large amount of tax revenue for the state. And uh, there is still a large, you know, big banking problem with this as far as on a federal level. And so to create a special purpose depository for these 
institutions in Colorado would, is a it's a value proposition that makes sense for Colorado because it keeps their cash cow moving as far as what provides their taxes their tax dollars here keeps the roads you know paved and cleared and you know that's important and so uh, you know Wyoming has been trying to take the lead on this as far as being like the new Delaware except you know when Delaware is where everybody goes to incorporate they want crypto businesses to be coming into Wyoming and you know, I'm starting to look more of Wyoming and Colorado as being like this front range area and just not really trying to look at the state lines anymore. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot to go in here, like we're talking about with geopolitics and what's going on. I mean, creating a special purpose depository institution, I mean, you're not calling it a bank for a good reason. You got to be really care careful with your words here and the marketing of this because, uh, you know, you don't want to raise the alarms. You kind of want to get this through and get things running before people can start trying to take you down. I mean, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, you know, it seems like an obvious step to take given the, the work that, like, Trace and Caitlin are doing in Wyoming. You know, that's that's pretty much what has kept – like the the big exchanges in the U.S. going that haven't uh, had problems is close ties to banks, like banks that the investors in those companies had shares in. So they were pretty much able to go to the banks and go, "You will bank this business." So like you you really do need to tie like the, that that fiat side of things deep into your business, or that's always a, a rug that can just get yanked out from under you. Yeah, and uh, you know the chat's talking about like what kind of court case would be needed for this uh, SPDI, and um, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think uh, anybody really knows. Like when we talk about this SPDI in the realm here in Colorado, I could tell you, man, the working group on this—it's like we're all flying by the seat of our pants. This is uncharted territory. Nobody knows what we're doing as far as like where is the you know where when is all of a sudden you know the fire going to get started like whenever we say the words like this or when we word it like that and you know i mean you just you want to get this thing moving to where you could actually build these things before you know there's just too much opposition against you because yeah i mean but there's a lot i'll tell you here in Colorado, and I'm sure it's the same in Wyoming, there is a large effort to get this thing going. And when you start talking to people about it, average people that don't understand these things, and you say, you know, we're building an alternative banking system to try and help route around this, you know, this federal censorship for the dispensaries, everybody gets it. It makes sense right on the surface of it. So, I mean, like, it's an easy sell. And it's one of these things where when we talk about, like, these things breaking up state lines, and I mean, money is very jurisdictional. And like, you know, if you are using a money, I mean, it's to serve a market. And like, if that market is like the main market, I mean, you know, this is where, yeah, I mean, the geopolitics, you know, it doesn't, it's not just international. I mean, this is a national thing. I mean, like New York and the coast of California have controlled this economy for a long time. And if you start getting like this uh, large amount of money being produced on the front range, and that money being used against those constituents, I mean, you know, this is a, it's a big conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be really interesting going forward. But, you know, I, I definitely think like they're uh, going to really try to push this in the long haul because like Kraken is a huge business at this point and they know how important it is to have those banking channels that, that won't get cut off. Yeah, and that's another big thing in the story is just like, Props to Kraken for being the guys that are stepping up and doing this. You know, like they're the ones that stood up to the New York Attorney General whenever he put out that letter and, uh, you know, talking about the bit license and what all is required of them. And now they're like the first to step up and say, you know what, we'll work with this state. We'll create this uh, special purpose depository institution. We'll see what lines we cross. Like we've got customers to serve and there's a market. Let's do it. Great job, Kraken. Mm hmm. All right, so there's some other institutions that are trying to serve some markets. Like, uh, what's going on with uh, ING? Yeah, so this is really kind of interesting. Uh, they, they had a brief period where they were actually banking Bitfinex. But um, they're working on, according to rumors, a digital asset uh, custody project being run out of Amsterdam. And so, like, this is this is not like 
anything quite like what just happened in Germany, where banks were pretty much cleared to officially handle and custody things like Bitcoin themselves. Like this is more of an institutional type thing by the read of it, but it's the the fact that they're even looking into this. And I mean, the, the, this this article from Reuters is pretty much, or Reuters is painting it as kind of a thing to deal with digital assets generally, or, or things like stable coins. But the, the simple fact of the matter is um, that it doesn't matter. Um, if they iron out an actual procedure and system to handle a, any kind of crypto asset, uh, you're pretty much talking not really that major changes to support Bitcoin instead of a stable coin or Ether and so on. And because, you know, the, the, the real core of that is just keep the key safe and the thing that's signing uh, with the key safe. So that that's pretty generalizable. And so I, I still think it's, it's a pretty big deal. You have a major bank in, in Europe actually looking into custodying of these types of assets. I mean, like that that is just absolutely fucking huge. And like we really are getting to the point where we're starting to see like dominoes flip. I mean, look at the, the past year, we've had back launch, Fidelity launch, uh, the, this law passed in Germany allowing uh, retail banks to custody crypto and hold accounts of crypto for people. And now ING, like th- those, those big financial institution dominoes are starting to fall. Yeah, I mean, uh, ING, uh, they were in some stories like uh, not too far back, I think, for banking Bitfinex or Ipinex, uh, one of those companies. And so, yeah, it's a good thing to see them, uh, you know, looking into custody. I mean, it's, um, you know, start looking into this industry. I mean, custody is a really important aspect, especially if you're a bank. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, it's not really much there. Just click a domino falls. So I guess you want to take us into the next update? All right. So uh, this one's a little bit, you know, I don't know. I thought it was a pretty big deal. So Back released their futures product earlier this year, and uh, now they released options to those contracts. You know, as we, as, as well as a uh, new cash settled futures contract, which that's a big deal in the world of these more institutional products. Before the launch of the options, traders would enter into one of these physically delivered monthly contracts, and they were locked in for that period of time. Now with these options available, it gives traders the ability to exit outside of that edge their position. Another new product in the announcement is this cash settled futures based out of Singapore. Add those to the physically delivered futures and it's a nice suite of products built on Bitcoin. Here are some quotes from the announcement, quote, As our benchmark Bitcoin contract continues to set new trade volume and open interest records, we are excited to share that we've launched two new products that both leverage that benchmark contract. Backed Bitcoin monthly options, the first CFTC regulated option on futures contract for Bitcoin. This contract is based on the benchmark backed Bitcoin monthly futures contract and settles into the underlying futures contract two days prior to expiry on intercontinental exchange futures. U.S. price discovery occurs completely within a federal completely within a federally regulated market and has no exposure to unregulated Bitcoin spot markets. The backed Bitcoin options offer important hedging, trading, and income generating opportunities to market participants around the world. Now the, let's, okay, and this continues on, the cash settled futures, uh, new cash settled futures contracts available on ICE Futures Singapore, an approved exchange in Singapore that offers participants in Asia and abroad a convenient, capital-efficient way to gain or hedge exposure to Bitcoin. This contract leverages the settlement price of the benchmark-backed Bitcoin monthly futures contract and provides an alternative for participants who are unable to trade our physically delivered contract. Close quote. So if you want to take advantage of those cash settled futures, you have to be trading in Singapore, but the options are available to anyone trading at backed. And, uh, you know, if you can't get access to the backed monthly futures contracts because of the fact that there's a pretty high, uh, you know, it's an institutional product. So it's not just everybody gets access to it where these cash physically delivered contracts, you should be able to trade on those. So uh, I think this is great news as it's building out that robust infrastructure and price discovery that makes regulatory agencies happy. All of this adds up 
to say it's less likely this market is being manipulated. It's also great news for traders who are trading it backed. Being locked into a monthly contract can seem kind of claustrophobic or boring. These options at least open up their ability to move around. And uh, yeah, now I think we should keep our eye on what's going on with all of this as it develops. It wasn't that long ago we saw the underlying physically delivered contracts were actually somewhere under 50% backed by Bitcoin. And they did rush uh, these options trying to be the first to market. I'm not saying they don't know what they're doing, but we should keep our eye on the system as it's growing because the volume over there is growing. You can keep your eye on that with the backed volume bot on Twitter. It posts the volume over the on over there on a daily basis. And they did hit an all-time high of 42.5 million in one day. And uh, that was at the end of last month. Daily volume more recently has been around 14.4 million. All right, what do you guys think about options on monthly contracts and cash settled contracts? I mean, it's... You know, it's just an obvious thing to do. Uh, they're just building out the traditional suite of products that are usually built together or on top of each other and kind of trying to all point it at their futures contract. Like, so, like, you know, I, I'm betting, like, what they're going to try to pitch this as you know, the CME futures contracts, those use actual Bitcoin exchanges, the scary Wild West exchanges in their index. Um, whereas backed is just looking at the settlement price of their own contract. So like it, it's, you know, they're, they're pretty much trying to build up an ecosystem where everything is just priced off their futures contract instead of these unregulated markets. Like they're, they're trying to build that kind of walled regulated garden area. Yeah, I would say that they've done it with this suite of products. And uh, yeah, I think um, we should definitely keep our eye open for CME options. They're coming available next year, early next year. And that's, you know, granted that everything is okay with the regulation. But if these contracts got through okay and they've launched, which they have, I don't think we're going to see any hiccups on the CME side. So uh, we should see we should see those contracts launch early next year, and uh, those would be something to keep your eye on too. Because, like you said, those are more uh, you know dipped into all the different exchanges, and they've been running for a lot longer than the backed contracts. So it would be interesting to see what they push out. Mm -hmm. All righty. So are we ready to jump into some drama? Man, I'm going to I'm going to try and stay out of it for the most part. You just take us into it. So BTSE, a exchange based out of the Middle East, um Dubai, uh is going to raise uh 50 million dollars. Um in a token offering on liquid and everybody is losing their fucking minds over this it's the most hilarious thing in the world um like people like all the east tards are trying to say that this is proof that block streams um capital raises were ponzi schemes um I, I don't know what the fuck they're thinking. It's, it's retarded. They're trying to compare the pointing out Ethereum is a scam and, and be like, well, Blockstream's a scam then. And so I'm going to break down why that's the most retarded thing in the world. So this is an operational business with revenues selling something that they promised to buy back. So taking on a liability that people will voluntarily buy this token in exchange for. So they will take this token, they will give it to you and take your money and promise they will buy that token back later. That is a liability. The company is taking on a financial liability to all of the people who buy this token and promising to buy back 100 million of these to burn. The other use of this, aside from just raising capital, is obviously the traditional like fee discounts on trading, blah, blah, blah. So the reason this is not a scam or a shit coin or any of the, the retarded things all the Ethereum lunatics are screaming because somebody's doing a token raise on something other than Ethereum is because it's an actual legal company 
taking on an actual liability. Unlike all of these nonsense Ponzi scheme ICOs where there's no actual entity taking on any kind of actual liability to the people who fucking buy their tokens, they just sell them worthless tokens and go, I have money now and don't owe you anything. That's why this is not a scam. So that said, um, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's all... All the exchanges are, are doing this kind of shit to raise money nowadays, and depending on their jurisdiction, it's okay to do. And I don't see anything unethical or immoral with this. Like they're raising money, they're attaching conditions to that and promising to fulfill those conditions. I don't see anything wrong with that. Like this is not a non existent project that hasn't been built yet where this team takes your money and goes, Well, we technically don't legally promise you anything, but cool magic will happen soon. Um, it's a whole different universe. So like honestly, it's like I don't care. Like, good luck. Uh hope it works for them. Like we're actually starting to see those first uses of liquid pop up. Yeah, wasn't this like you know, one of the things that Liquid was going to do. I mean, and this was like, I mean, yeah, whatever. These are just ETARDs that are getting pissed about the fact that, you know, Bitcoin was, you know, always going to be able to do these things that Ethereum wanted to do, but they were just like going to try and rush everything and hack it all together and it was going to work. And I mean, like we've seen those ERC-20 contracts are dog shit. And like, you know, you can have some anonymous guy come in and submit a pull request and just like screw up your whole wallet infrastructure and i mean like uh i don't don't know man this is one of those things where um i don't i don't know man this is like yeah it's a little it's a lot of drama i've seen this stupid stuff where people are trying to compare ethereum's launch to to like block streams launch or something is supposed to be this network that has supposed to be decentralized where Blockstream has always been a company and they've been a company trying to provide a product and they've been working really hard and really long and invested in that product and they could finally bring those products to market and like don't get upset whenever like a long time ago like this was kind of like in the roadmap was you know being able to provide these token infrastructures that are actually audible and secure yeah i mean it's you know it's like every everybody is spurging out about this saying like the the maxis are losing their mind in hypocrisy and it's like no I mean, you know, I'm speaking for myself here. Um, I have consistently said for the past two or three years, like I have no problems whatsoever with ICOs if there is actually a thing built that works, that is what you are telling people that they're giving you money for before you go do that. If you want to raise money or do your stupid shit, it, it, okay. Um, if you have the thing there, you're not scamming people. It might be a stupid idea. It might be retarded and implode. But if you have the working thing and then you go, hey, guys, can we raise money to make this happen? There's nothing wrong with that. That is a completely different thing than just, hey, guys, can you give us money and we'll maybe possibly make this impossible thing work down the line, although we don't promise anything legally because we just want your money? Like Those are <laughs> nowhere close. And it's like it, it's it's hilarious to see like all, all the East Tards scream hypocrisy when it's like, no, I'm that that's that was kind of the dominant attitude I, I remember seeing everywhere. Man, I bet you they'll be screaming the same nonsense whenever uh all of these <laughs> collateralized contracts turn to shit too. Oh mm-hmm. man. All right, though so I guess uh Janine, you're up. What's yeah. what what's going on with spaghetti? Where's my spaghetti? Janine, uh, touch my spaghetti. Janine, you with us though? Oh, I did start talking, but I guess you couldn't hear me. Ah, uh, yeah, we got you now. So, what's going on? Take us into uh, what's going on in Italy and their uh, and their what they're doing. Cricket. Okay, can't hear you again. <laughs> Hello, Janine. Oh my god, my notes are moving when I'm clicking the audio button. It's really annoying. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go for it. Okay. So, anyway, where was I? Um, you can cut that whole part out. That was weird. 
Um, as part of a uh, nationwide cashlessness uh, campaign, the Italian government has um, decided to raise the ma or lower not raise lower the maximum threshold for cash payments from 3000 euros to just 1000 euros um in practice this will actually be lowered gradually down from 2000 euros uh so right now it's 3000 and then starting in 2020 um just not even a month away it will be 2000 euros and then by uh 2022 it will be down to the 1000 goal 1000 euro goal on top of that, um, for any businesses who refuse to accept digital payments at all, they will start imposing a 30 euro plus 4% of the transaction value penalty um, on those businesses. So, yeah. Uh, the government, uh, now, I mean, that's not a huge cut, but still, I mean, I think it's the principle of this that they're penalizing businesses who don't want to participate in digital finance, which is pretty draconian in my view. Um, the government, uh, especially the so-called uh, left parties, claim that these measures are intended to curb tax evasion, but as the original article written in Italian goes into, uh, which is linked in the first tweet, this will mostly just be making life a bit more difficult for everyday people who, you know, want to pay someone to renovate their house or buy a car. And those things, you know, go up into the several thousand, if not tens of thousands of euros. So that means they're going to be forced into using digital payments. Now, you might argue some, like a lot of people are already using digital payments for those kinds of big purchases. But then again, you're penalizing people who maybe they saved up, you know, some cash on the side for, uh, you know, years to be able to purchase this car or to make this renovation on their house. And it's not something that they've just been keeping in the bank because, oh, I don't know, maybe the banks are taking their money or they're starting to impose negative interest rates. I don't know, things like that, that maybe they don't want to hold all of their savings or any of their savings in a bank um, and now those people are being penalized and so uh, basically there's this sense that the drive to abolish cash is the result of collusion between the state and large companies especially financial companies to increase control over people's money because the supposed goal of curbing tax evasion makes no sense um, there's also a quote um, in the article that I've translated and I want to read it where they say the abolition of cash above all is about the supremacy of the state over the citizen and his choices of consumption, investment, and savings. The banks are demanding to pass on the negative interest rates imposed on them by the ECB, the European Central Bank, to their customers. Uh, end quote. And then at the end of the article, they also mention that Germany's stance so far in comparison has been the opposite and the culture continues to be the opposite of this because... Um, many stores and shops in Germany, even in major cities, uh, even capital cities, do not accept uh, debit or credit card payments. And Germany remains one of the most prolific uh, cash favoring countries in Europe, even for a quite substantial percentage of uh, large uh, transactions or large value transactions. And um, let's see. Uh, and then, so the the reason I found this is because Murr on Twitter said, quote, uh, the Italian war on cash is a never ending story. 1,000 euros was already the limit from 2011. Then it went back up to 3,000 euros and now back again to only 1,000. Many small shops and activities don't survive and others will close soon because of this limit. Great way to help the economy and protect our privacy. Um, that last sentence was obviously sarcasm. Um, and then uh, Federico Tenga responded below her to say, the funny thing is it was previously increased to 3,000 euros because it was creating too much white noise, old people getting reported just for using cash without helping the financial authorities at all. Not only is it authoritarianism, but it's also stupid, end quote. So yeah, I don't like this at all because the whole idea of cash is that you don't have to rely on any single company or payment processor or bank 
to basically use your money the way you want to for everyday things. And so this, like all of these efforts, like it's happening in the U.S. where um, Visa is trying to basically bribe businesses into becoming uh, cashless by saying, like, we'll, we'll offer you a higher percentage or a higher cut or we'll reduce our fees or whatever. We'll give you a certain amount of money uh, in order to become cashless. And I hate all of these initiatives because um, I personally, as I've mentioned a number of times, I pretty much do all of my purchases in cash. Um, the only time I really ever use any kind of banking infrastructure is to maybe if I have any money in a bank at all, which is not very often, I might look at it and then I'm going to go take it out of an ATM. I don't. I don't do digital payments. I haven't used my debit card to buy something like an actual object or anything or even a service. Um, I haven't used it since at least three years, I think. Can't remember. Um, so I don't, I don't like any of these uh, trajectories. Like stock. Mike is stuck. Yes. Still stuck? Yes. Yeah. That's a nightmare, though. I mean, like, I've been seeing a lot on Twitter about Christine Lagarde talking about how, like, they've got, you know, digital assets are, like, the plan. Digital assets by mid-2020. So, looks like uh, these people in Italy, mid-2020, are going to get some sort of maybe digital EU uh, dollar, digital euro and uh, they're going to be forced to use it and uh, yeah that's pretty nightmarish Aaron Russo google that name and watch that man's videos that's all I'm going to say what's he talking about you're all going to get chipped all right well yeah, I mean the war on cash thing. That is like you know, I knew we all we talked about this stuff coming on for a long time. It's hard to believe like it's actually here. Like that's where when we started this episode off, it's hard to believe it's halfway through December and we're headed into 2020 and all this stuff has been moving forward. It's been a long, you know, slow effort to attack people on all these different levels to where you know the uh, the tyranny is closing in, man. Yep. Speaking of, I think that is a good shitty segue for this next shitty story. Well, excuse me for the burp. Um, we still caught half of that. Yep. So, Bottle Pay, the Twitter tipping service for the Lightning Network, uh, is shutting down. Uh, everybody pretty much has two weeks from today, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, to withdraw all their funds. And the reason they're shutting down is the five AMLD European uh, Union regulations on anti-money laundering coming into effect on the 10th of January would hit them hard as a custodial based wallet. And they, they've decided, uh, Pretty much with the amount of personal information they would have to collect from everybody, um, they're, they're just going to shut the business down. They're, they're not going to try to keep it running with that kind of invasive information gathering as a, a requirement for running the business. And, you know, it's you should go read their, their announcement in the, the show notes. I linked the tweet. Um, you know, they've never really charged uh, for anything, added any extra fees or sold anything, you know, so it's, they're, they're pretty much, uh, the, the way they put it is they can, you know, close everything out and keep their heads held high, that they did things, you know, as in line with the ethos, or ethos of the space as they could. So, yeah, anybody out there that uses these, privacy invasive things you shouldn't be using uh and go pull your money off before the two weeks is up because it will probably be a 
red tape bureaucratic nightmare to try and get anything back after that. Oh, man. Yeah, that is some bummer news. I mean, like, yeah, I saw that. And, yeah, this is just, um, yeah, this is uh, bad news. I mean, this is where, like, we got to start building these jur- jurisdictions that are going to be very favorable for this and for this market and not uh, not just shut everybody down. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not really much I have uh, to say beyond that. Just, you know, it sucks. And, uh you know, it sucks for Matt Odell. I uh, just got the, the consulting arrangement with them a little while ago. So it's pretty shitty. Uh, fuck retarded government regulation. All right. Fuck but, government. Yeah. Fuck government. Let's, uh, let's get into something that's like a little bit more, I don't know. It's a little bit more entertaining to discuss about. It's certainly the buzzwords of the, of the days. So, uh, Janine, you want to take us into what's going on with MakerDAO? Yeah, so I've been seeing an article for the past couple of days written by Micah Zoltu. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, It's been making the rounds because it focuses on the ability of a stake-rich person to basically steal the tokens of Ether from the MakerDAO system and everything that relies on it. So he writes, uh, quote, anyone with about 40,000 uh, MKR, which is, I think, the, the, the acronym for the maker token, uh, which currently it's valued at about 20 million USD, uh, can steal all of the collateral and MakerDAO, both DAI and Psy. I didn't even know Psy existed. Okay. Along with a good chunk of assets from Compound, Uniswap, and other maker integrated systems, uh, in total over 340 million USD in value. Uh, end quote. So he further alleges that the Maker Foundation could attack the system in this way right now if they wanted. They have way more than 80,000 uh, Maker necessary. What is worse, um, A16Z, I don't even know how to pronounce it, it's basically the. Uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz company, has enough uh, maker on hand right now to execute the attack uh, the patient way. Um, And he describes what he means by the patient way in the blog post if you want to read more about that. But he continues, there's a couple of other maker holders whose identity is unknown to me who hold enough to execute the patient version of the attack as well. And then after that, that, there are a handful who uh, would need to collude with one or two others to execute the attack. What should scare you here is that there. this isn't uh, hashtag DeFi, this is CeFi, uh, but instead of only one person being able to steal all your money, the bank, the bank or any any of a number of large individual shareholders or a group of smaller shareholders could decide to steal all of your money at any time, end quote. Um, so funnily enough, the MakerDAO people must have realized that this discovery would blow up in their face. Because on December 9th, the same day that uh, I saw Micah's article, uh, the MakerDAO Twitter account shared a post about some polls that had been activated in their voting system uh, by the Maker Foundation Interim Risk Team. And they have since added a vote to change the governance security module. Uh, described in their post as follows, the GSM... Uh, is designed to give the maker token holders a chance to review any changes that will go into the system and act accordingly if those changes are deemed to be malicious. Since the launch of MCD, the delay has been set to zero, as in there is like zero time for them to make any kind of governance decision. Uh, This is pointed out, especially in the the blog post that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, So continue. Uh, This allowed the community to take immediate action to mitigate technical errors, uh, or you could say uh, miss the <laughs> miss the ability to take anything but immediate action. Uh, Oracle malfunctions, outlier cases like market panic or an economic attack. As the likelihood of these events began to decrease post-launch, it is nearing time to review the GSM discussion regarding the optimal amount of delay to enact. Um, has now been moved up due to the foundation being notified of a blog post which details a series of events which could lead to an exploit of the governance system. And of course, at no point in this blog post do they give credit to the person who described this attack, even when they have a thank you session uh, section at the bottom. 
Anyway, the community previously considered the possibility of the exploit, but it was not an immediate issue. However, the probability of this exploit grew due to the potential publicity from the aforementioned blog. For this reason, the community is being presented with a poll to mitigate this hypothetical exploit in advance of our typical debate and consensus-seeking processes. End quote. So yeah, um, okay, uh, Jesus and Ethereum people, um, here is something you need to learn. If the, quote, potential publicity of an exploit uh, is such that the exploit is much more likely to happen uh, within a period of like three or four days to the point where you think it's worth convening an emergency community debate to change your consensus process, I think that basically constitutes that it's now an immediate issue. Uh, and it probably was an issue that you've just been ignoring for a long time. So keep in mind, um, it, and it's also funny, like they, they don't, they didn't consider it, uh, really relevant before, but they now consider it relevant conveniently right after this blog post was published. Excuse me, my cat is eating gingerbread. Um, <laughs> sure. so, uh, yeah, keep in mind only a, as, as they have now, um, acknowledged, uh, as was written in the blog post, only a relatively small group of people, or one person, depending on who's controlling all of these uh, keys to the stake, um, only a relatively small group of people could turn malicious and make this exploit a reality in literally no time at all. Uh, zero. So if you think the... <laughs> My cat is also sniffing the mic. Uh, if you think the incentives are there to uh, take advantage of it, then the information about it doesn't need to travel much. So I don't understand what this like ha kind of like half-assed, uh, you know, we already knew about the fixing it and now is the time kind of response is. But anyway, yeah. You see, we knew this huge critical vulnerability existed, but we didn't think it was a big deal because no one knew it was there. But now that people know it's there, we should fix that. What was it they were going to say about security through technical obfuscation or something where it's like, you know, Ethereum is secure because, you know, there's a lot of technicalities built into it. In order to understand those, you got to be pretty sophisticated. So it's secure. Yeah, it's security theater. You know, you're right on. Stop. And it's the same, what is it? Decentralized theater is what you say, Janine. Like, that is right on target. I mean, it's security theater and decentralized theater, and it's also just like a house of cards. And, I mean, this whole, like, over-collateralized system, I mean, like, I get it. Like, the whole idea of banking is to provide banking services, which includes, like, loans, and, you know, you need to lock things up for periods of time and create these contracts. But, you know, all of this stuff, like we've been saying, has been built on these systems that are very insecure and it's been dog shit contracts and it's just sort of been hacked together where yeah it's like you know like we were saying in that last story where these you know ethites are losing their heads it's the same thing when it comes to uh this maker dow situation and just the whole DeFi movement whenever there was one coindesk article about how rsk can build something or is thinking about building some sort of maker dow type system and everybody on it is like what the hell, you know, the Bitcoin, all of a sudden Bitcoin is like, that's some sidechain project that's not on the base layer. And guess what? They're going to probably work to make sure that it's a more audible system than you're building because it is built with Bitcoin. And yeah, I mean, this thing, I keep looking at it going, I don't know when it's going to fall down, but I, I just kind of have this in my mind, like it's going to fall down. It kind of, I wasn't there before 2008 and everybody knew about these you know, stupid uh, mortgage contracts that were just like entirely over leveraged, but certain people knew about it. And, you know, I just feel the same way looking at this thing where it's like all of this stuff is built on this really insecure project. And you guys really are touting the name MakerDAO and DAI and all this stuff without ever saying the word Ethereum. And that's what it's built on. It's security through Rube Goldberg machine. Excuse me, everyone. There was a vulnerability that we've been aware of for quite a while, but now that everyone knows about it, we can no longer exploit it ourselves, so we should just patch it. <laughs> <laughs> and the exploit is awful, god-awful. I mean, like, you know, it is like, okay, anybody can that has this large amount of stake, 
you know, can uh, basically just wreck the system, which we were saying that about that delegated proof of stake system. I mean, you know, this is just one of those where you try to reinvent the wheel that Bitcoin created and you're going to create all of these insecurities in the system and vulnerabilities. And I mean, somebody, you know, they don't even have to be somebody that wants to wreck it. You know, God forbid somebody just, yeah, knows somebody that knows somebody that's in control of this thing and like, you know, somehow gets a hold of them and just opens a short on Maker and, you know, all of a sudden they have an emergency meeting about how, you know, the entire system is about to get blown up or something. I mean, it's a uh, it's a scary situation. Just like it, it's one of those things where I don't know if the people involved even understand that they're putting like a, a price value on like their head. I don't want to say it, you know, even. But I mean, like it's the reality. I mean, it would be so hilarious if we had another DAO catastrophe in Ethereum where. It it would it, it would be awesome if it was like a combination of the DAO incident plus the the parody uh multi sig issue where it's like someone just accidentally broke it and <laughs> took everyone's money. <laughs> Everything gets locked up, set on fire, and forked away. Oops! I accidentally triggered triggered this governance bug. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, that's an entertaining story. Almost like nesting a million different consensus mechanisms into a single global consensus mechanism that's completely broken is a horrible idea. Ah, security theater, decentralized theater. So, uh, yeah, now that we, you know, pulverized Maker down into the ground, like, uh, what happened to Keep Key? I guess they got pulverized down into the ground by Kraken. What happened there? Well, um, this is kind of interesting. Um, so I still have not been able to completely confirm my hunch here, but I think this is the unfixable uh, hardware issue with the STM32, um, the, the, the Trezor has that too, a uh, bunch of stuff uses it, but um, um, I think it's the, it's the cold cards as well, but they have the whole different setup with the secure element that is a big part of the security model. So this can't really be used to pwn things the same way with anything using a secure element like that. But pretty much any hardware wallet just using the STM32 on its own uh, is totally wrecked in a physical attack. Um, so uh, Kraken put out a whole series of blog posts on this. Um, the second um, blog post, the, the really in-depth uh, technical breakdown is linked to in the show notes, but you can find the rest um, at the, the bottom of that one. Uh, but pretty, pretty much the gist of it is, um, there is a flaw in the, um, the bootloader or the, the boot ROM with the STM 32. <clears throat> so you can glitch while going through the boot process during the, the boot ROM before it actually loads any vendor software. So all the, the, the crypto, the, the Bitcoin specific software gets loaded and downgrade the security mode on the memory so that you can read out of the, the RAM. And the, the big problem with this here is that it's happening literally at the most basis level of software loaded on that chip before all of the keep key or in the Trezor's case, if, if this is possible there, um, which, you know, it's, it is, um, like regardless of whatever you do in your, your crypto firmware to mitigate this, it doesn't matter because the attack happens before all of that software gets loaded. <clears throat> and so pretty much, um, you glitch through um the the boot rom loading downgrade the security memory and then <clears throat> you can guarantee you've successfully done that before any of the the keep key or trezor firmware software is loaded on the chip 
<clears throat> to do anything to protect what's in the memory. So you, before any of that's loaded, you guarantee the memory is in the mode you want where you can read it, and then <clears throat> let the hardware wallet software load, pull what information it's going to pull into the RAM of the device, and you can extract it from there. And given that um, it's only encrypted um, in the case of the, the keep key, and I'm pretty sure with the Trezor, not positive though, with just your pin. And once you get that encrypted seed off of that device, you can just brute force that. It's like I think on the keep key, nine uh, pins or nine numbers is the biggest pin, and the key to encrypt the seed is just derived from the pin. So that, that's trivial to brute force. So, like, pretty much anything, like, if, if I'm right, and this is the, the unfixable uh, exploit recently talked about with the Trezor, which I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, um, you're, you're wrecked if somebody gets your device physically. Like, your entire threat model should now be, if this device is stolen, all my coins are gone. You should immediately move things and, and keep in mind do not just mix all of your UTXOs to move things, but move things to a passphrase, one that you are positive you will not forget or lose. And I would say go the full step after that to get a more secure device that actually uses a secure element. <clears throat> because it's, it's just like this is out there now, this is completely unfixable in this chip, and Kraken's estimate of what it would cost to build a, a idiot device to do this is like $75. So th this is pretty much the new landscape now, and you should completely adjust your coin security accordingly. Yeah, I don't know how many people were taking Key Key 2 seriously. I mean, you know, I've met these guys. They passed me one of these things. It's funny. It's like a running joke. It's like everybody in Colorado's got like a Key Key sitting around their place just still in the vacuum seal, like hadn't touched it. I mean, it's just because they throw these things out. They're passing them around. And, yeah, we haven't really seen much development going on in that space other than, you know, they have been working with Shapeshift and, you know, Shapeshift has been trying to build out this new non-custodial exchange and the way that it operates. But yeah, I mean, we're in a day where you're going to have like, you know, other competitors out there, guys like Kraken, who are like, hey, you know, that, you know, you saying it's non-custodial, but look at the way that there's all these security holes in your setup. And so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's a different landscape and it's one that's competitive and you know, in that competition, you better make sure that you're building out what's right for, uh, you know, people's Bitcoin security. Otherwise, somebody's going to try and uh, expose that. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, dude, just for like shits and giggles, I, I had an old keep key fucking sitting around. Uh, it took me my bare hands in about 30 seconds to get the screen cover off, uh, which only broke a few of the plastic latches which would not have shown if i just put it back on there and um i i ended up destroying the the case to get the actual chipboard out but now seeing how it's put together all all it would take is is a fucking a hair uh dryer or something to just heat it up enough to get the uh the glue that puts the the case over the chip in place off and, and then be able to put it back together. So like, this is something realistically like going forward, someone could grab your device, do this while you're not home and then put it back or just load your seat on a new one and leave it there without you noticing and not just steal what you have now, but wait and steal what you're going to have later too. So I recently tried to use one of the new keep keys that I got for free. I'm not going to say which event it was, but it should be relatively obvious. Um, <laughs> uh, and I don't know what the hell was going on, but I couldn't even get the firmware to update. Like it was basically stuck at this point where it was like, you have to do a firmware update. And it's like, okay, trying to do that. Why is it not happening? And while that was happening, I kept getting all of these prompts, 
like going just just getting the device to turn on and the app to open everything it kept giving these prompts to like open a shapeshift account and i'm like no thanks nope don't want to do that not interested in shapeshift this is a keep key it's a hardware wallet don't need shapeshift for that and it just i like could not get the firmware to update and i'm wondering if there was i mean that might be a separate issue from the shapeshift prompts but i'm wondering if they've now started to make it so that you can't actually use the device without shapeshift or if they're moving in that direction it would not surprise me at all well that's retarded um because you know like i said like this this exploit any hardware wallet based on the sn or stm32 that does not also have a secure element is wrecked forever for all time if somebody gets their hands on it it's wrecked and kraken says 75 dollars, you get an idiot device that an idiot can fucking run this exploit with so it's just like you know fuck just the keep key like stop using devices that don't have a secure element like they're at, at the very least this specific like chip the stm32 without a secure element because it, it's wrecked done there is no fixing it oh man this is where it's like you really got to stay on the cutting edge with custody and like you know i've got a treasure a ledger and a keep key and like i really want a cold card because like that's just like Next level that's like where we're at with the cutting edge because you know like you're saying this is a vulnerability with these secure elements and i mean like this is a another a no, vulnerability it's, it's, that... a, it's with the the mcu like the you need the secure element to be safe from this okay well maybe it's just the competition between hardware wallets like treasure and ledger and all of that that we've seen this year that's kind of got me a little spooked to where I'm like, I got to get a cold card because, you know, it's like, well, these vulnerabilities are kind of in everywhere. And I'm just thinking about, you know, yeah, this new shape shift exchange model is kind of like you need to sign up with a keep key, a treasurer or a ledger. And like it kind of offloads the custodial aspect of the, like what all they have to expense for onto the customer. And like uh, maybe Kraken saying like, and I mean, and rightfully so. I mean, like maybe that's not a good business model for these exchanges. I mean, like, I don't know. That seemed, that's something I just thought about in the discussion that we're, you're having is like, okay, maybe they're trying to just sort of offload the custody aspect of this and the cost all incurred on that. But yeah, there's definitely like a lot there where a lot of users can get that wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, I, I, like, I seriously like, fucking props to Kraken for publishing this as like somebody who does not have a hardware product in this space because like you know it's like I said I'm I'm almost positive this is the unfixable treasure exploit uh that 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 came out a few months ago and it's like you know good like let's get this out there and let's get people to acknowledge the reality now because the details are out there now it's not just a this flaw exists and we won't tell you how it works All right, man. So, uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. So, oh, getting a spam call. What's going on with Virgil? Um, well, so the the biggest development that I've seen, which is not that big unless you're kind of following legal documents, but um, finally, the docket for the case is available on Court Listener. If you don't know what Court Listener is, it's basically a... Uh, uh, project uh, it's a free law project which um, they basically tried to take uh, pacer documents at least the ones that uh, pacer is willing to make available for free or would normally be available on pacer for free and you can read them and get a convenient little PDF and everything and a nice little organized docket um, so for the longest time, I think I don't know when it went live, but um, when I checked it like last week, um, there was still not a docket available for this case, which, you know, part of me was like, well, it's a new case, so they probably haven't uploaded anything yet. The other part of me was like, this is a national security kind of related case, so maybe they're not going to make anything public. I didn't know, but now the docket is available. There's, um, I think, maybe 10 documents or so. Um, 
on the <laughs> that's the sound of a cat <laughs> getting its frustration out on some cardboard <laughs> um so there's about 10 documents now um not looking directly but the latest one that has anything really of substantial interest is that um uh what is it called it's i think the warrant of removal and commitment to another district number 10 um and that's about how uh basically because the uh indictment came out of the southern district of new york he's going to most likely be transferred to new york if he hasn't been transferred already we don't know because uh there isn't a document in here that actually says whether he's been transferred but it might have already happened um but basically uh he was originally uh as his lawyer said on twitter the judge had approved um the request to release him on bail using the homes of his i think it was his parents and his sister as collateral um in case he did uh fly away but uh apparently the government has since um tried to block that release order until december 9th so it's uh possible that it's possible they were successful it's possible they weren't we don't know because that document hasn't been added yet but basically the government tried to prevent him from being released on bail um and they were given until december 9th to uh argue that i guess and so you know not sure when he's going to be transferred or if he's been transferred i don't think this document says that but yeah that's the latest update in the case that at least according to the docket um there was the government tried to prevent him from being released um before trial well um yeah, uh, I get why the government wouldn't want to let him get released, but at the same time, I don't see even an idiot like that pretty much leaving his family homeless so that he could run away. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, if he didn't try to stay away before, I don't know if he'd... <laughs> I can't see him trying to actually go away now. Mm -hmm. um the only other thing i wanted to say is uh again i know shinobi is not a fan of laura shin um Whee! but <laughs> there there are she she did an episode with um actually a woman who i think is at the human rights foundation um that she actually korea um through i think i think she escaped through south korea first and then she went to china and so basically the episode is her telling her story about how she escaped and what it's like to live there. And they briefly talked about Virgil's case towards the end. And she was saying about like what, it, what the impact is of Western people uh, deciding to become tourists. And what like some of them think that they have this like savior complex where they're actually going to help people there by like showing them that they're oh look i'm a good i'm a good person and maybe i'll sneak them some money or something um and she addresses that by saying that uh one of the propaganda points that they're given throughout their entire life is that you know north korea is the envy of the world and um even the foreigner like the foreigners are all jealous of us and you can tell that they're jealous and that they respect our leaders so much because when they come here they bow in front of all of the statues and the portraits which is exactly what tourists are instructed to do because if you don't you risk getting shot like there was uh she mentioned a woman who um was just told like don't cross this line because i guess they were near a section um some kind of area where they weren't supposed to go and she crossed into that section i don't know why maybe she's like they're not going to hurt me and then they shot her right there and then so yeah they basically the north koreans see all of the all of these tourists coming and they're like there's the proof of the propaganda because they're not being they're they're not visibly being forced to do it they just look like they're doing it um so it's not helpful basically the, she said the only way to uh 
the the there are more effective ways of helping people than just becoming a tourist and giving them money which is another thing like e to even get into north korea is super expensive relatively um like virgil paid i think it was like four thousand something dollars to go and where is that money going it's going to the regime it's going to these tourist agencies that have direct connections with the government um so it's just a, it was a really interesting episode i do have to warn you though uh, and I hate this about podcasts, but she has this, like, she has one of those, like, mid-episode sponsor ads in the middle. So you're hearing this, like, really horrific story about her being sold into sexual slavery. And then this sponsor ad comes in the middle. And it's really jarring, so just be aware of that because it was really jarring for me to go from that to that. So other than that, interesting episode and perspective on the case from someone who's actually from there. Yeah, that does sound like an interesting story, I'm sure. I'd, I'd like to hear that. What podcast was that on again? It's Laura Shin's, um, what is it, Unchained? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll have to check that out. Mm -hmm. All right, well, in the interest of not having a over two-hour episode, I'm going to jump into the next one real quick. Uh, so Nunavut, Canada, uh, is in a real interesting situation right now. Uh, I, I would argue that this is probably the most serious ransomware attack, um, there has been, um, even though it's literally in a town way in the Northeast of Canada, um, it's, got 38,000 people there um, and pretty much it shut down all of the uh, health, family services, education, um, legal and financial systems in the entire town to the point where um, literally the whole town is counting on food banks to feed themselves because everything is shut down and just not working. And they're projecting um, having to rely on food stamps until into 2020 to actually get the, the systems up online. And like, I, I don't even, I don't really think that this is entirely a legitimate thing. Um, but like people from the town, um, government were kind of blaming the fact that they have to rely on shitty internet connection as a, a part of why their security practices were so horrible. But Another part of this is like this. This happened while the entire, um, pretty much IT team for all these systems um, to respond to cyber attacks were on vacation, and so that this this entire town is pretty much just ground to a halt to the point that they need to count on food stamps now to eat because even their financial systems are completely fucked. Um, like this is pretty bad you know what i mean like up until now like all we've really seen is like you know, public transit systems like government records cause things and just just make problems for people on the fringe but th this is literally a whole town that's had to just go um food stamps free food because there's nothing else we can do right now to make sure people don't starve because all of these systems are down and like, yeah, that, that's kind of a, a big precedent shift, I think, in my mind, as far as all, all of these ransom attacks go. Yeah, man, these ransomware attacks are just going to keep attacking public infrastructure till you know, people start to take security seriously, and then they'll start to think more about maybe having some Bitcoin on supply in case this thing doesn't happen. It's like, you either better upgrade or better hold some Bitcoin. Or just take their security seriously. I mean, like... Oh, look at this like this whole town's just done like they, they've had to resort to food stamps because a few key technical systems had all of their data encrypted and held ransom yeah you know how it is though man a lot of these you know public infrastructure systems and digital stuff it's like let's keep all the doors open man let's make sure we can surveil the hell out of this stuff and yeah that's terrible security Mm -hmm. You know, this is, it's going to be an ugly thing as it keeps evolving. 
But yeah. On the last note, though, um, and on a positive note, there is a new toy to play with, everybody. Uh, Async's uh, new Phoenix wallet. Their their attempt at the uh, the super noob just just pick it up and go wallet is out. Uh, and actually, I've not had a chance to load any Bitcoin on it yet, but it's. I, I really like the, the simplicity here. It's just a send and receive tab. Everything else is entirely in the options. And uh, the, the entire wallet is pretty much set up so that there is no on-chain funds managed except in non-cooperative close cases. Like you, you send money to the wallet on-chain and it automatically loads up channels. Everything um, is kind of set up to autopilot manage that. There, there are emergency switches in the settings to close channels and then force close and things like that. And they um, have no on-chain support really beyond loading the wallet or um, support for a trusted um, on-chain swap where you can send a sync uh, Bitcoin over the Lightning Network and they'll make an on-chain payment for you. So you you do kind of have to, to trust them during that kind of payment. But, you know, it's, it's really stupid simple. Uh, I, I think any person capable of using a normal smartphone app would be able to wrap their head around this very simply. So, like, you, you like playing around with new wallets and stuff? Then go, go play with this. Man, that's honestly, yeah, I guess uh, so this is like uh, the Eclair wallet is no longer really uh, a wallet. I mean, are they still doing the Eclair or is this the new wallet? Yeah, I mean, it's still there. Uh, it's not gone anywhere. And from my understanding, they're kind of going to maintain in parallel, I think. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, new wallet. You can check it out. I'm just looking at it like through the tweet. Like, uh, you know, surprised to hear you get so excited about it whenever they're talking about, you know, there's like some privacy concerns on it. Yeah, th this this is not a, uh, yeah, that this offers no privacy advantage over a custody wallet. Um, so you can see, uh, you can actually look up um, on their site some of the explanations of trade-offs, but um when you open a channel um they do charge a fee because they also match um with some of their liquidity on their side for receiving um they do not charge for any kind of like pulling money out onto the main chain um they do charge a fee for that um swap out to chain where you pay on lightning and somebody receives on chain um and th this is a trampoline um wallet uh li like i said last time we we talked about this th there is no routing anything happening on the wallet it connects to asyncs node which calculates the routes so like absolutely keep in mind like async sees the entire payment and there are these fees for things but you know this this wallet is not for you or me or Janine. This is for people who can't figure out how to make something like a Claire wallet work. You know what I mean? And over time, because um, trampoline nodes, um, ones that calculate routes or parts of routes for you, are um, something that is planned as a standard on the Lightning Network. So over time, there will be other people besides Async running a trampoline node. But for right now, um, they see all of those details. Yeah, digging through this more, you can see they've got blog posts on the trade-offs and how this is uh, something that should be mitigated in these trampoline payments as they become more prominent across the Lightning Network. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, you know, they're kind of the first ones out of the gate with it. So until other people catch up, like they're the only ones running one. All right, let's get some more trampolines out there. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, Janine, you got anything to toss in on that? Nope. All right, then we move into final thoughts with five seconds to spare until the two-hour mark. Kaboom. All right, I'm going to give a final thought to uh, just say how awesome it was to see, like, you know, BTC Pay server kicks on. Like, I mean, I didn't watch the game, but, I mean, like, I've seen clips of, you know, uh, is, uh, what, is it Russell 
Russell uh Russell O'King. Russell O'Kung O'Kung Yeah, O'Kung, I think, yeah. Yeah. He uh he wore those VGC pay sneakers at a game and I was watching the highlights and I was like, Oh man, that's pretty awesome to see like you know, I mean it's just one of those things where it's like Bitcoin is becoming more prominent and like, you know, you I think we've seen like Bitcoin advertisements in like soccer leagues in the Europe, you know, you know, maybe football or whatever. Well, this is like American football and like, you know, one of these starting linemen, you know, is like a big guy. He's got these big, bright green shoes on for BTC pay server. I think that was awesome. So uh, just a shout out to Russell and Bitcoin is and everything there. And I know he was talking about maybe traveling around the country a little bit. You should come to Boulder, man. Check out what's going on over here. I know you said you love Boulder. And, yeah, come on back. We'll uh, we'll host a bunch of Bitcoiners together, and we'll talk about what Bitcoin is doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty fucking awesome. So, Janine? Well, so when I said at the beginning of this episode that I was in complete darkness, I wasn't really referring to the time of day or the weather. I meant societal darkness and despair because Orange Man's atomic blonde brother has been given a siege of power again, which means there's no, ch- no chance of pressure coming from the office of the prime minister to maybe, maybe get Assange moved to a less draconian prison, maybe fully released because... No, I don't trust Atomic Blonde Balloon Boy. Who's that? Is that that Boris guy? Boris Johnson. He was. He's like the. He, he's like the British Trump, right? Every country deserves their own Trump. Well, this is where it was like just you know it shows goes to show that Trump wasn't just a locality thing. It was something that's been going on predominantly across the, the world. But uh, yeah, I'm. A bunch of people reading on uh on twitter yesterday about some election going on over there it's incredible how much it's like i just like i just don't know much about what's going on over there other than i know it's a parliamentary system and yeah the conservatives got a massive uh like did they dominate right now they are aren't they like uh like close to half or a little more uh now do you need um, I don't remember, but I think so. The The vote was counted overnight, so there's no more. I don't I don't think they're still counting. I think they finished this morning or the afternoon. Yeah, what I saw was uh, like 300 seats uh, went to the conservatives, and I, I think there was like one other party that got like 100 something, and it just kept tailing off. I'm sorry, Britain, but you should have left that country back whenever we boarded the boats in the 1700s or so, man. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. that, that, was, that was way before the 1700s. <laughs> what was it? It was like the late 1400s? Like, I mean, you know what? Yeah, we could talk about, like, everybody was coming to America at a certain point. Like, you know, where I'm from, New Orleans, like a lot of that stuff's been around for thousands of years, man. That place was before the United States, and it's continuing on. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess, uh, yeah. My final thought is I hate adulting and having things to do because Expanse Season 4 just dropped today. I want to do nothing but watch the whole series, but I have things to do. I hate adulting. Just got to get up early and get it all done. But yeah, that's as far as the show goes. We got it all done. I guess with a little over two hours, but that's all right. We uh, we're gonna work on that. Mm-hmm. So I guess uh, hope it was fun, punks. We'll catch you next week. Adios. <laughs> Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet.